it's really great to be here. Thanks so much for the invitation, and thanks to you all for getting up bright and early. This is like the earliest that I get up ever, so I'm like amazed to see this room as full as it is. Um, especially, uh, and I'm also super excited to tell you about some of the work that Matt and I have been doing, but also just in general, a little bit about Bayesian time series, which I think are uh, some of the coolest models out there. So um, let me get started on that. So I have worked with a lot of neuroscientists. One of the application areas that I find most interesting are these, uh, are these types of uh, data sets that are being collected in neuroscience where they have simultaneous measurements of the behavior of animals. This is a mouse being recorded in Bob Data's uh, lab over at Harvard Med School. This is actually work that um, Alex Wilchko and Matt Johnson have worked on a bit as well. Um, the cool new thing about this is that while the mouse is running around in his environment here and we're getting a depth video with a Microsoft Connect overhead, we also have a little cable that you can sometimes see uh, coming out of the mouse's head, and that's recording from hundreds of neurons in the striatum, which is an area of the brain that's putatively involved in action selection, so figuring out what these mice do. And we have these two joint data streams, neural activity and behavior, uh, and we're trying to figure out how to synthesize those two data sets in order to get some understanding of how the neural activity actually gives rise to the behavior. And we see this not just in mice, but across a number of different types of organisms. We have these types of data sets. So one of the applications that I'll be talking about today in this talk are, um, are recordings, whole brain recordings of C. elegans, which are these little tiny worms. They have 302 neurons in them, and we can record uh, roughly 100 of those neurons in the, in the nerve ring at the front of the, the mouse's brain. And we can ask, how does that neural activity in the brain there give rise to the different types of behaviors of these, of these worms? Um, another collaboration that I've been working on for a while is with Florian Engert's lab at Harvard. And here they're recording, it's a very similar setup, they're recording from zebrafish as they swim around in a tank. And these zebrafish are, in this case, they're free. They're not head fixed or anything. We don't have any neural activity yet, but we're working on that. But what we can do is we can see the zebrafish, you can see it just there, it attacked and ate this paramecia, which are the prey, the food that it eats. And um, we can quantify this behavior in great detail. We can identify points along the tail of the zebrafish, we can identify its eyes and the eye angles, which turn out to be really important for talking about what the, what the fish is doing. When it's attacking or hunting a prey, its eyes will converge so it can really focus its field of view on that, on that prey. And then we can ask all sorts of things, like how does this behavior, now quantified in this high-dimensional way, how does it depend on what the fish sees in its environment? Or, uh, or similarly, how does it depend on the internal states of that zebrafish? So we're coming up with all sorts of cool uh, time series models to try to explain the behavioral dynamics of these fish. And then just one more example of this. Again, uh, all of these are from neuroscience. So this is an example from Mark Churchland's lab at Columbia where they study how, uh, they study primates doing motor control tasks. So these primates will have some visual cue and then they'll have to reach their arm, make a motion towards, say, a dot on a screen. And while the, um, while the monkey's performing these tasks, they're also simultaneously recording again from hundreds of neurons in motor cortex. And so they're asking questions about the dynamics of the neural activity and trying to relate that to the dynamics of the observed behavior, which they can, again, quantify in terms of you know, the, mass, or the monkey's hand position, velocity, acceleration, all of these different things. And so across all four of these, uh, these different application areas, there's some, there's some similarities here. In many of these cases, we're seeing just high-dimensional behavioral recordings collected alongside high-dimensional neural recordings. And they all have a temporal flavor to them. They all have rich, complex dynamics. And we're interested in trying to explain these two. As I said, today I'll talk about uh, one of these application areas in particular, uh, namely these whole brain recordings from C. elegans, where the data actually comes to me in the form of a big matrix like this, where we have roughly 100 rows in this matrix, and then roughly 3,000 time bins of, of neural activity. Some of these rows come along with labels. Since the worms are genetically uh, stereotyped, we can, every cell in these, or every neuron in these worms has a name. We can't always identify from pictures like these in the upper left which neuron or which cell is which, but in many cases we can assign a label to it. So we get rows, row labels for some of these, and then when we look at the low dimensional projections of this activity, we see that you know, with a small number of principal components, we can often explain a large fraction of the variance, and we can project the activity into this three dimensional PCA space and kind of see how, it, how these trajectories evolve. And we can try to come up with good models for how that activity will evolve in this low dimensional space. 
So to summarize some of the, the similarities between these different, uh, these different application areas, I think in systems neuroscience we're seeing that high dimensional joint recordings of neural activity and behavior are really becoming the norm, not the exception. Um, these, are, these are data sets that labs around the world are collecting on a daily basis, generating terabytes of data. It's just an amazing mass of data that's being collected. And these data have all sorts of features that we'd like to be able to take advantage of and to explain. We often see that low dimensional projections of this data are able to capture large fractions of the variance, but we see that the dynamics in that low dimensional space are often very nonlinear. We see across, structure, across dimensions of neural activity, across time, and across trials, across many different organisms, we see all sorts of shared structure that we'd like to be able to explain. In many of these cases, I didn't really talk about it too much, but we have missing or obscured data. You know, sometimes we don't know what the, what the neuron label is, or sometimes we lose that neuron for a couple, of, uh, a couple of time frames. So we'd like our models and our inference algorithms to be able to handle that. And in some of these cases, the observations aren't just continuous signals. They're often very discrete in nature. So we'd like to have a, a framework that's allowing us to handle both these types of observation domains. And again, I'll, I'll be talking about neuroscience in this talk, but I think that this list is not necessarily unique to neuroscience, but rather is, uh, is a set of features that we see across systems biology more generally. And I think this is probably true of many of the types of data sets that you're collecting here at the Broad. Um, so hopefully that some of the lessons that we learn in studying these neuroscience problems will be very applicable to the things that, that you're thinking about as well. And I'd be really happy to talk to, to people afterward about you know, how these, these types of approaches may or may not be useful to studying your problems. So you know, how should we get started? I'm going to do something that's, that's probably a little bit upsetting to the machine learning people in the audience. I'm going to project the entire space of machine learning models down onto one dimension. And you know, I, th I actually don't think this is that gross of a simplification of the state of the, uh, of the field. I think there really is a spectrum of approaches that range from, on the left-hand side here, relatively specialized models that are somewhat limited in capacity. It sounds like a bad thing, but there's actually a lot of advantages to those types of models. They're easy to fit, they're data efficient, and often once we fit them, we can go in and we can look and see, you know, what have we learned? What do these parameters of these models mean? So I'm thinking of things like Gaussian mixture models, PCA factor analysis, you know, kind of stepping it up one level, things like hidden Markov models and linear dynamical systems. On the other end of the spectrum, we have a host of models that are very flexible, very powerful models. Um, However, in making these models more powerful, we often sacrifice our ability to do inference. We have to turn to more generic inference algorithms like simple stochastic gradient descent. Um, at the same time, these models, you know, due to their flexibility, in order to tie down the parameters, we need uh, a lot more data, which isn't necessarily a problem. As we said, we're collecting tons of data. Um, one of the things that I think is a challenge and uh, perhaps the harder challenge is that once we fit these rich models, things like recurrent neural networks, for example, you know, how do we go in and make sense of what we've learned? And so, you know, as I said, I think this is a spectrum. I think both sides of the spectrum have advantages, and one thing we'd like to do is be able to strike a balance. And I think, you know, I'm obviously a little biased, but I'm going to put switching linear dynamical systems right in the middle here because I think it does a really great job of striking this balance between um, ease of understanding but also able to capture rich, complicated patterns of data. And actually, you know, one, of the, one way to summarize the research agenda that I'm following is trying to push these models a little bit more to the right, retaining some of the advantages of these simpler models while also being able to capture uh, complex patterns of, in, the, in the data sets. And that's where I think the switching, recurrent switching LDS, which I'll introduce today, has some advantages. <coughs> so uh, before I get started, let me just give you a brief outline. So I'm going to start by uh, giving a primer just on Bayesian state space models in general, kind of building up the, the foundation in order to understand all the pieces of the recurrent SLDS. It's not that complicated, and I think um, I think a lot of these building blocks, you know, while there's some while there's a lot of technical depth there, they're they're easy easy to um, to get a grasp on. Once we've done that, I'll introduce the RSLDS, and I'll talk about one way of doing inference via an augmentation technique. And then I'll finish by showing you some, um, some recordings of C. elegans. And I should also say, if there's any questions throughout, just you know, feel free to raise your hand, interrupt, whatever. Um, happy to take questions along the way, as long as John says that's OK. We'll be encouraged. All right, sounds good. <laughs> cool. Um, so let's get started. <laughs> 
state space models. I'm going to use state space models and time series models kind of interchangeably here. Um, you know, time series models are like one sort of special case of state space models more generally. Um, our data is going to start. We'll assume that we have some sequence of, of uh, say, frames of video in this example here. Each is a big uh, set of pixel values that are maybe telling us the height of the mouse at each point in space. We can unroll those pixels, and what we'll get is a set of pixel values, y1 through yp, evolving over time. And then the, the uh, conceit of these models is that we can explain these pixel trajectories in terms of these lower dimensional latent state trajectories. So we'll call these x. And we'll actually be working in discrete time, so what we'll do is we'll bin time and we'll assign one value for these pixels and for these latent states in each discrete time bin. One way to view these types of models is in terms of a probabilistic graphical model here. And so in this type of representation, each node represents a random variable. The edges between nodes represent the conditional dependencies of this model. So y1, the first set of observations, depend on a latent state at time 1, as well as the global parameters of the model. Um, nodes that are filled in are the nodes that we observe. The nodes that are not shaded, these are the ones that we would like to infer, that we'd like to compute, say, a posterior distribution of. So we don't know what the latent states are necessarily. We can try to estimate them. We don't necessarily know what the parameters are, but we can try to estimate them based on some prior knowledge about the system, some constraints of our model, and then, of course, the data that we observe. Now, this representation is obviously very powerful and very flexible, but it doesn't really tell us too much about the functional form of those dependencies. It just tells you that there is some relationship. So in certain special cases, say the case where all of those edges represent linear and Gaussian dependencies, another way that I think is useful to view these systems is in terms of sort of these block diagrams here. So this is telling us that the latent state at time t plus 1 is going to be a Gaussian distributed random variable whose mean is this linear function of x at time t. You have a dynamics matrix A, some bias, bias vector B, and then some, uh, some covariance matrix Q over here, this symmetric and positive definite. The observations, likewise, are going to be a function of the latent state at time t mapped into observation space via this linear, uh, this linear function here with emission matrix C and some bias D, and again, another covariance matrix R. So you can't do this in all forms of dependence, but for linear Gaussian systems, which are you know, perhaps the, the canonical type of state space model, um, these, this representation works. So what can you do with a linear dynamical system? Well, one way to view these dynamics is in terms of this vector field. You know, where does this matrix A and this bias vector B push you if you start at some point in X space? So you can do things like rotate around some, uh, some point. You can do rotations and converge toward the center. You can do these more skewed rotations and these, spir these spiraling types of patterns. You can also, of course, explode. You can have X that diverges. And sometimes, you know, well, we don't usually see that in our data. Most of the time our data is, is you know, confined to some range. So you don't usually see that explosive patterns. But really, you know, these are kind of a qualitative description of what you can do and what you can achieve with linear dynamics. And I mean, when you look at this, I think you say, well, my data doesn't just spiral around, spiral around forever. So you might immediately start to think this is not necessarily a rich enough model class to capture most data sets. But that's not to say that these aren't useful models. In fact, one really simple way to, to leverage these linear dynamics is to compose them together. And that's what a switching linear dynamical system does. It says that at each point in time, I again, I have my continuous states x, my observations y, but now I'm also going to have this discrete latent state z. And this is just going to be a discrete um, indicator for each time bin. Am I in state 1, state 2, state 3, or state 4? Here, just color-coded blue, red, yellow, green. And each one of those states, these discrete states, is going to have a corresponding set of linear dynamics. And that tells you that if I'm in discrete state in the blue state, then I use these maybe fast rotational dynamics, red state slightly slower, yellow state slower. These, in this case, it's all different periods of, of rotation. Um, but by composing these, these discrete uh, combinations of linear dynamical systems, you can achieve highly nonlinear dynamics. Um, so let's see, you know, how does our graphical model change here? Well, it's very similar to before, but now we have an extra row of discrete states on top. 
I'm going to use this color coding just to sort of you know, visually cue you into which, uh, which variables are which in these types of pictures here. And of course, we can also look at the, at the functional view of these as well. So what changes here? Well, now we have some model for how the discrete states evolve over time. Z at time t plus 1, we'll assume for now is just a Markov, is just following a Markov process. So you look at what discrete state was I in at the previous time, that tells me which row of this stochastic matrix to use. And that gives each row as a distribution over the next discrete state. So I'll grab the row, I'll sample another discrete state. The thing that changes here is that once I have that discrete state, that's going to index into a set of different linear dynamics parameters. So um, I'll have different sets of A, B, and Q for every, every discrete state. You could also have different observation model parameters for each discrete state as well. But in this talk, we're going to just make a simplifying assumption that those are shared across discrete states. That just allows <laughs> us to sort of view the continuous latent states uh, in the same basis or in the same subspace over time. So as I mentioned, you know, one of the reasons why we like these types of models is that they're able to model really uh, complex patterns of nonlinear dynamics, but they do so by using really relatively simple and understandable linear dynamics uh, as building blocks. So let's take a, a simple look at, say, a Lorenz attractor, which is arguably the canonical nonlinear dynamical system. It's got a three-dimensional latent, a three-dimensional state. And the dynamics of that state are nonlinear. They involve multiplicative interactions between the different dimensions here. Um, when you simulate this type of model, or this type of system, what you get are these sort of, what I think are kind of like butterfly patterns. You'll end up rotating around in this plane. And then at some point, chaotically, you'll switch. And you'll start rotating around in this plane. So what happens when you fit this with an SLDS? Well, almost what you would intuitively expect. You can split this type of nonlinear dynamical system into two different linear systems and do a really good job of approximating the dynamics. So when you're in this red state here, this is well approximated by just one rotational linear system. And then when you get to the middle, sometimes you switch and you go over to this blue system and then you rotate around there. And when you unroll this over time, you're plotting the three different dimensions of state and just color coding them by the discrete state, you see that you know, these jumps correspond to you know, where there's a big jump in, uh, or these changes in discrete state correspond to places where there's a big jump in the dynamic systems here. And then what I'm plotting here are just vector fields. It's kind of hard to see on the projector, but basically the true dynamics and then the linear dynamics implied by the blue, the inferred blue or red states are very similar. Now, another reason why I think these switching LDS models are, are useful tools is not just that they can approximate these nonlinear dynamics, but also that often those discrete segmentations that you get out are meaningful and useful. So they tell us something about, say, different modes of behavior. So in the case of C. elegans, we might find, or what we will find, is that these different discrete states correspond to different actions of the worm. Things like crawling forward, crawling in reverse, dorsal and ventral turns, for example. And these discrete states, in the case of the worm, we're going to infer them from the neural activity. And then we'll look and we'll correlate the discrete states with the actions of that worm. And we'll find that there's a really nice close correspondence. And so that's kind of a cool thing. That tells you that um, you know, each one of these different modes of behavior you know, maybe is actually a relatively simple thing. And that what this worm is doing is it's actually switching between relatively simple states to achieve its, its complicated patterns of behavior. Yeah. I was just wondering if you could talk about how we specify the number of discrete latent states ahead of time. Is it something that we can yeah. learn, or is it something that's from uh, prior knowledge? It's a, repeat the question. Yeah, OK. So the question is, how do you know how many discrete states to use? Um, that's the concise version of it, yeah. I think. And um, that's a question. That's a really important question and kind of a hard one to answer. But um, there's a number of approaches. One is that you can say, you know, based on my knowledge of the system, I think there are in this sort of ballpark number of states. Another way to do it is to use a more flexible type of Bayesian model, something like a non-parametric model that says, I'm going to allow there to be potentially a countably infinite number of states. And then we have the data speak for itself. The data is going under this, this HDP, this hierarchical Dirichlet process, which is a certain type of Bayesian non-parametric prior. There'll be a penalty for adding more states. So 
that the prior is biasing you toward using fewer states as long as the data allows for it. So there's sort of this trade-off. Now, the answer is not quite that simple because you still have to set some parameters of your, your non-parametric prior. You have to tell it sort of how, well, there's sort of like a scalar parameter that tells it sort of how much capacity you might expect. So, you know, I think Matt will probably talk more about this, or may or may not talk about it in his talk, but you know, there's, there's kind of an art to how you, how you do this. Um, and it ultimately, I think we'll rely on you having some domain-specific knowledge to at least get you in the right ballpark and then let the data take it from there. Yeah? I take it you're reducing the dimensionality of the data be fortifying these models, otherwise you'd have gigantic models in these. Um, we can do it both ways. So sometimes what we'll do is some sort of dimensionality reduction on the raw pixels to get us down to tens of dimensions, or yeah, 10 to 20 dimensional observations, and then apply these models. But in theory, you could apply these to the raw data space. Now, I mean, when you look at these, at these switching LDS models, for example, you know, this connection, let me see if I can go back a couple slides here. Yeah, yeah, this part of the, the model here is basically telling you that, you know, my big tall vectors Y I can really explain as a linear projection of some, some low dimensional state. And that's kind of like the, the probabilistic interpretation of PCA to some extent as well. Um, that there's a linear mapping, um, with, in the PCA case, sort of Gaussian noise that sort of goes to zero, uh, in this, along the diagonal of this R matrix here. But, um, that's kind of a, a side topic. I think, the short answer is, in practice, to make our lives easier, sometimes we'll do the, some dimensionality reduction first and then apply the models. But in theory, you could apply it on the on the raw pixel space. It would incur more computational cost, but conceptually, there's not a, a problem with doing so. Yeah? Do you have any feedback from the continuous state and the discrete transitions? That's a... That's a great question. That's actually the main point of the recurrent SLDS is to build more knowledge into these discrete state transition models. And so that's like the whole second half of this talk. That's a great setup for, for what's next. So yeah, let's get right into that. Um, we talked about SLDS models. Um, actually, let's put it on the back burner for a couple slides because I want to tell you a little bit about how we do inference in these models, but then we'll get to the, to the recurrent bits. So, you know, I mentioned uh, doing inference. What is inference? Inference is this process, this computation of some posterior distribution, of some estimate of uh, the, the distribution over these latent states, but also over the, over the parameters. So if we look just at the, continu the continuous latent states for now, what that might mean is give me a mean and a variance around uh, under the posterior for these discrete states. So some sort of, you know, estimate and error bars. Um, one of the reasons why we like the linear dynamical systems and systems composed of linear pieces is that inference is often more tractable. So when we have a linear dynamical system, we can do inference over these continuous states and also discrete states by analogy um, by composing a set, of, a set of operations, two operations that we interleave. So we'll start with just an initial distribution on x1, which I'm going to represent by this little graph fragment here. And then we'll imagine taking the corresponding observations at that point in time, combining these two potentials, these two nodes, and collapsing them down into one. That's what this conditioning step is here. The second operation that we need to be able to do is this marginalization operation. We need to be able to take a graph that now looks like this. It has you know, one fixed distribution potential over here, and then some other, vari some other unknown random variable here, xt plus one, and somehow integrate out x at time t in order to leave you with just this marginal fragment, again, that looks just like this. And these two operations, you know, let's see how they, how we can compose them. So we have, you know, let's just look at the LDS case here. We have this string, the sequence of continuous random variables that we would like to infer. We have a corresponding set of observations. And then we'll imagine we have this initial, dis initial distribution hanging off. So we're going to start by conditioning on the observations. That's going to collapse us down to this, this model here. We'll apply our marginalization step, get rid of x1, and we're left with x2. Uh, and, and now what we're left with is a graph that looks just like what we started with, except it's one time step shorter. And so we can do this again and again 
iteratively applying and interleaving these steps in order to basically remove nodes until we get to the very end and we're left with just now a distribution over the very last time step. It looks like the CL again is just eight. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that might be a good, well, yeah. <laughs> one way to think of it, I guess. <laughs> okay, so we get to the end. This is basically telling us the distribution over X5 given all that's come before. When we collapse out those nodes, conditioning and marginalizing, we're basically reducing this graph to one that's just a distribution over the last thing. This is the marginal distribution over the last time step. Now we're going to do this in reverse. Once we know this distribution, this is that's as cool as the animations get in this talk here, guys. I can show it one more time. That's it. So once you have this, what can you do? Well, you can take this and you can sample or compute the expect, expected value, if you will, of this uh, of this last time step. And now we have x5. Remember, one of the intermediate steps was that we had a distribution where this node represents everything that we knew about x4, given what came before it. Now we have a fixed value of x5 that comes after it. We can combine these two pieces of information to sample or compute the expected value of x4. Once we do that, we can do it for x3, x2, until we get to x1, where now we know everything there is to know about x1, given all that's come after it. And then we, of course, had that initial distribution from before that tells us, combining these two pieces, what the distribution of x1 is. So, you know, these, these steps of conditioning and marginalizing, you know, in theory, you could do this regardless of what your model was for the dynamics of the observations. But in practice, these steps are only going to really be tractable in certain cases. So if your model is linear and Gaussian, then both the operations of conditioning and marginalizing will give you back another linear Gaussian potential. If you have discrete states, as we do in the, you know, the discrete top row of the SLDS, well, again, there you can condition and marginalize, and you'll always just get back another discrete distribution. But really, these are the only two cases where this works, <laughs> as far as I know. Um, in the discrete state, in the discrete case, in the linear Gaussian case, where these two operations have these really nice closed form solutions. In general, what you'll get is that every time you marginalize, you end up with big mixture distributions. And every time you condition, you get distributions that have, don't necessarily have nice closed forms that are easy to represent. So in the general case, these operations would lead you to sort of a blow up in the complexity of your model class. But for the linear dynamical systems and for you know, discrete state models, you can do these two things. So let me click through this here and get back to the next step. So what this means is that we're able to sample from the continuous states given the discrete states in the observations. We're able to sample the discrete states given the continuous states. Um, what, is the, what does this look like in the linear Gaussian case? What does this actually look like? So the reason this works, again, is because when you have this big linear Gaussian model, really, the big joint distribution over all the continuous states is one big Gaussian. Um, and of course, you could sample this one big Gaussian uh, if you can compute its covariance matrix and its mean. Um, but in general, that would incur the sort of cubic cost in the number of time steps, the like order t cubed operation. That message passing is really just allowing you to do this in an order t complexity algorithm. And the reason you can do it uh, is because the inverse covariance is this very structured thing. It has this banded block tridiagonal structure to it. And really, another way to view this message passing is that it's inverting this block tridiagonal matrix in a very efficient uh, order T way. So, as I said, we can sample values of these, of these latent states. And what that allows us to do is compose these operations into this Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm. And this will really be like a block update algorithm. So what we'll do is we'll iteratively resample our continuous states, given the discrete states, which we'll assume we have an estimate of or a sample of, and the observations. Then we'll update the discrete states, given the continuous states, and then we'll update our parameters, given both of the above. And we'll basically repeat these three operations, drawing many, many samples, and over time these samples will converge to samples from the true, dis the true posterior distribution. So this is a special case of an MC. This is a type of MCMC -MC algorithm. You could also do things like mean field variational inference. And Matt's actually going to talk a bit more about that in his talk, ways to alternative ways to do it. But they're all based on this sort of 
the sort of intuition that when you have your model based out of these simple pieces, um, you can you can build these types of block coordinate inference algorithms. So with that, let's talk a little bit about extensions to these SLDS models. And this was kind of set up uh, from before. How is that different from Gibbs sampling? This would be like a block Gibbs sampling algorithm. That's right. So we've talked a lot about how awesome switching linear dynamical systems are. Let me tell you about why they're not like they're not so awesome. <laughs> um, well, the problem with SLDS models, or one of the problems in my mind, is that they're open loop models. So the discrete state at time t plus one is only depends on the discrete state at time t. It doesn't know anything about continuous state or exogenous covariates that you might have access to. And so the premise of this work on the current SLDS models is that we should try to take advantage of those pieces of information. For example, in the Lorenz attractor, you know that this red state here, and not only does it follow red states with high probability, but it also only occurs when you're in this sort of half space, when you're on the right-hand side of this diagram. Likewise, the blue state only occurs on the left side. So if you knew where you were in this continuous state space, that would tell you a whole lot about what discrete state you should be in. And so the simple idea of the RSLDS is to give your model that information, to say that the discrete state at time t plus 1 should depend on my previous location in continuous space. Um, we have found that the, this is a special case of hybrid systems, which are uh, well studied in the control literature. There's actually some work that, that's sort of buried in this paper on, uh, from Barber in 2006 that introduces this model class as well and derives an alternative type of inference. And I think one of the important pieces is, is that you know, conceptually, it's a very straightforward thing to do. You, know, any, you can draw this arrow. Anybody can draw this arrow. The hard part is that when you introduce this arrow, you've broken the nice structure of your model. It's no longer the case that these continuous latent states have only linear Gaussian dependencies. They actually have now these discrete dependencies hanging off them. So inference now becomes a much greater challenge. This, at least the algorithm that we presented before will no longer work in this case. So um, before we address that problem, let's, let's kind of look and see how this model conceptually works. So the idea is that for every point in continuous space, we'll have a distribution over next discrete states. And one way to, to introduce this distribution is by sort of partitioning the space iteratively into different sections. So we'll imagine that the discrete state, the, the first discrete state is used with high probability when you're in this sort of half space of continuous of the continuous space. If you're not in this one, well, the next one's used with high probability in some other chunk. And the yellow is used in this sliver over here, green in this corner, and then purple. The last one kind of gets whatever is left over. This is one way of chopping up this continuous space uh, such that you know, the dynamics that you use depend on sort of your location in space. Functionally, what that looks like is that in our graphical model, there's no longer this Markov process governing the discrete states. There's actually now some functional dependence on the continuous state. You could also put in previous discrete state over here. I've omitted it in this picture. Um, but the short story is that basically, we want this distribution over next discrete states to depend on x at time t. And there are many ways to introduce that dependence. Um, one way, perhaps the most, uh, the most straightforward way to do that is with something called a softmax transformation. And the idea would be that for each discrete state, what we're going to do is we're going to lay down some sort of linear function on continuous space. So each of these states will have some sort of linear, uh, linear hyperplane here. And then what we'll do is we'll superimpose those. And the relative strength of these different linear functions will tell us about the, the distribution over the continuous state. Um, what I showed you before is actually uh, what we'd call a logistic stick breaking type of transformation, an alternative to a softmax. And so in this transformation, what you do is you lay down a linear function for, and that tells you sort of how to decide whether or not you go into the first state. And what we'll do is we'll make a series, a sequence of binary decisions. We'll say, do we go into the first state? If not, we'll have a linear function that tells us, you know, how to partition the remaining space up. When we get to the last state, it just gets whatever is left over. And so this gives you different types of partitions than the softmax type of model would. 
Um, there are pros and cons to this, and I should say this is sort of a schematic. This isn't. This is meant to be more of a conceptual figure than an actual like uh, exact functional form for these. Um, but the main difference is that you know in both of these cases, what you get is a distribution over over next discrete states given where you are in continuous space, but they have different functional forms. Um, we can view this alternatively. Well, well actually, make, let me make one more point. So at every point in continuous space in this picture, we have a vector of numbers that tells us about the, prob the sort of relative height of these three different linear functions. Down here, in this case, we have a vector of numbers that tells us for every point in space, you know, what's the probability that I go into this one or into this red state given that I didn't go into the blue state. So these are two, uh, two different, sort of conceptually different ways of, of partitioning space. We can view these alternatively in terms of how points in this sort of three-dimensional real space, like the relative heights of these different linear planes, map to points on the simplex, where every point in this triangle is a non-negative vector that sums to one, so uh, a distribution over three states. And what I'm showing here is that, you know, if you sweep out a, a circle of points in this real uh, R3, and then you apply the softmax transformation where you exponentiate and then normalize, what you get is that the green point maps to this corner down here because it's got a large value of psi 2, uh, but close to zero um, value of psi 3 and of psi 1. And likewise, the blue point has much lar the largest value of psi 1, and that ends up pushing it over closer to this corner. The stick breaking transformation, you know, now what we're saying is we have three states, but we only really need these two numbers to represent them. The probability of going into state one and the probability of going into state two given that you didn't go into state one. And if you sweep out a circle of points in this setting, what you get is by applying the sequence of, of this is sort of the mathematical definition of that, what you get is a sequence of points that kind of look like this teardrop. So these give you different ways to map real spaces onto the simplex. And you know, you might say, I don't really like this logistic stick breaking transformation because it means that you know the first one has sort of priority. There's an order dependence in this transformation. Um, and that's certainly one of the things that we've we've thought about. That disadvantage is, I think, sort of counterbalanced by some of the advantages that we can take uh, into account when we are developing our inference algorithms. And so I'll show you, show you how, that, how we do that. I mean, the fundamental problem, as we said before, is that by introducing these extra arrows, we break the Gaussianity of these, of these models. And it's not that all of a sudden the conditional distributions are like horribly non-Gaussian. It's just that they're almost Gaussian. They're kind of skewed. In these in these different ways, so these are almost these are like little egg shaped distributions. It's almost even hard to tell from this. And these are real examples that I came up with here. Um, and so the intuition is that maybe we should just be able to approximate these these almost Gaussians with something that is Gaussian. And that's how this and that's where this augmentation scheme comes in. It's the polygamma augmentation scheme. And the conceptually the way it works is that you know here's our distribution down here that we actually want. This is the thing that's not quite Gaussian, it's this blue curve here. Um, Laplace, the red curve, is the best Gaussian approximation to it. And the idea is that, while it's not quite Gaussian, one way to achieve this blue curve is to view it as a marginal distribution of this augmented space that has both psi, the variable of interest, and omega, this auxiliary variable. And um, there are many types of joint distributions that you can put in here that when you integrate over the y-axis, you get back exactly this blue curve. The thing that makes this particular augmentation scheme nice is that if you take any horizontal slice through this joint density here, what you get is exactly a Gaussian distribution, a Gaussian density. They're shifted and they're, they have different variances. However, each one of these conditional distributions is exactly Gaussian. And so what that suggests is that if somehow I was able to augment my model with a bunch of these auxiliary variables, then given those auxiliary variables, I get back to the nice, easy Gaussian case. The other thing that I'm not showing here is that if you were to take a vertical slice through these densities, that what you would get are uh, these polygamma conditional distributions, which aren't textbook distributions, but they're distributions that have nice properties. Namely, we can sample from them, and we can compute expectations of them. 
And these are the two properties, and these are the types of properties you need in order to develop things like MCMC or variational inference algorithms. So we're gonna use this augmentation scheme to introduce extra variables into our model and, uh, and then apply all our nice linear Gaussian tricks. The, uh, the catch is that you can only do this for certain types of models. And this is gonna end up working for the logistic stick breaking version of our model, but not for the softmax version, at least not as directly. So mathematically, what's going on here? Well, it's all based on this integral identity that, um, that relates functions of this form, functions that look a lot like the softmax transformations that we saw before, um, logistic transformations, to expectations with respect to this polygamma density. If we have such a den uh, an identity, we can go and we can look at the form of our models. And if our model is of the form uh, some prior distribution on psi that's uh, presumably Gaussian, and then some function of psi and z that is of this form, well, then we can replace this right-hand side with this integral identity. And what we'll note is that inside here, if we look at all the terms that have psi, there's this prior, this Gaussian prior. And then here's a term that has a, a psi squared in it. And this is gonna play nicely with our Gaussian prior. If we look at the terms that have the omegas, the auxiliary variables, we'll have the polygamma and then this term here. And this, uh, I'm not gonna prove it to you, but this will result in another polygamma distribution if you multiply this out. And so the upshot is that we can write this distribution over z and psi as a marginal distribution of an augmented space of z, psi, and these auxiliary variables omega. If we can do that, then we can do inference on this augmented space, and our marginals would be consistent. They would give us the, back the desired posterior distribution over psi. And in this augmented space, we have this nice property that the conditional distributions over psi and the conditional distributions over omega are nice and easy to work with. Um, this is a polygamma density here over omega. That's what this piece is. Uh, sorry, which one? Oh, sorry. This is a this is a polygamma density which is parameterized by two terms. One is this uh, this this first term is sort of like a shape. The second one's kind of like a tilting parameter. Okay. Um, and so it turns out that you know z in this case is assumed to be fixed here. So those are just two numbers. These are just two numbers here. Okay. Right. Yeah. So it's like a normal density with mean, mu, and variance sigma squared, but sort of analogous for polygamma. It's a good question. Um, and I should also say, I'm not expecting you to internalize all this math here. I'm just trying to walk you through sort of conceptually how this, how this works. And we can go through details offline if you're, if you're interested in how to apply it more generally. But um, you know, the key takeaway here is that it only works if your likelihood is of a special form. It has this logistic type term in it. And so what likelihoods look like that? Well, Bernoulli likelihoods have this form. Binomial likelihoods look just like that, and negative binomial likelihoods just are just like that, with different exponents in the numerator and the denominator. But what we want are actually categorical distributions. We want distributions over uh, k, uh, k different outcomes, not just in the Bernoulli case, two different outcomes. But these, the idea is that in the stick-breaking case, our distribution, our categorical distribution, actually was composed of a sequence of binary decisions. So it's really just a whole bunch of Bernoulli things repeated over and over again. And so we should be able to use the augmentation scheme for the Bernoulli case to, do, uh, to handle this now categorical case. The more general form of that is that if we had a multinomial distribution, which is like many categorical variables sampled independently, um, that that's like really a sequence of binomial random variables. So what we'll show is that, and what Matt and I showed in the NIPS paper a few years ago, is that you can do this augmentation for multinomials by applying the same sort of iterative sampling scheme, the stick-breaking scheme. We rewrite this density, we can rewrite it in this form, and then conceptually what happens is we first sample the number of red dots, given some the total number of dots and the probability of this being in this first class. Then we subtract off the red, number of red dots from the total, and we sample the number of blue dots, according to now the probability that you're in the blue cast given that you weren't in the red class. We do it again for the third, and then when we get to the last one, well, that's just deterministic. Whatever number of dots is left over, go into the green bucket. 
And in the case where you have a multinomial with just one dot total, that's, that reduces to the categorical case that we want. So what does that mean? You know, in the original unaugmented model, we had these things that weren't quite Gaussian. Once we condition on these auxiliary variables, we get things that are exactly Gaussian. So we can walk around this space of auxiliary variables, and oops, we can walk around the space of auxiliary variables, conditioned on them, we can apply all of our nice inference from before. And so this is really going to be a very similar algorithm to before, but with just one extra step. And we have code to do this type of polygamma augmentation on GitHub. So, you know, it works for these logistic stick-breaking transformations for the discrete states, but if you had Bernoulli observations or binomial or negative binomial, whatever, it would work there as well. So let me show you a couple examples. I'm running a little short on time, so I'm going to have to rush through some of these. Um, the first example is synthetic NASCAR, is what we call it. And it's just a simple model in which your state rotates around in this sort of track. So the yellow state is a straightaway that shoots over here. Blue state pushes you around. Green state's the next straightaway, and then red brings you back. We're going to observe a 10-dimensional projection of it, which I'm just going to show, which I'm showing down here. And when we infer this model, we try to fit it. Given these observations, what we get back is a rotated version of this latent state space because it's invariant up to these uh, invertible transformations. And the discrete samples show that we segment it uh, almost uh, exactly as the true model is segmented. However, if you, I should say, you know, SLDS would be able to achieve the same segmentation. The problem is that since it doesn't know anything about you know, where in continuous space you use these discrete states, when you sample from it, you get these complete messes, where it'll stay in the red state too long, and then it'll jump. It always jumps red to yellow, but it does so at the wrong times. When you sample from the RSLDS fit to this data, you get things that look much more uh, convincing here. Now, there is one problem with this. Uh, does anybody, is anybody a NASCAR fan in here? Don't be shy. I'm not really a NASCAR fan, but, you know, it's OK. Um, Anybody see anything stop. wrong here? What about the pit stops? There's no pit stops. That's one. You, man, you're the first person who has ever caught that, except for my advisor, Ryan, who's from Texas. And immediately upon seeing this, it's like, the cars are going the wrong way. <laughs> In NASCAR, the cars, what is it? They only turn left. But in this model, in the simulated model, they're turning right. No, no, you said 10 dimensional space. I was looking at it from the other side. I don't know. Well, that's what I said. If you look at how you fit the model, in the inferred model, we actually rotated it back to be correct. So the RSLDS will actually fix your, your NASCAR data for you. So one more point in favor of this, of this model. Um, we can go back to our Lorenz model. And we can do the same type of thing. We can now simulate discrete observations from this underlying nonlinear dynamical system and ask our model to recover the underlying dynamics. And this is much harder because you know, now you're observing, uh, well, you have 100 Bernoulli observations, but each one kind of conveys limited information about the underlying continuous state. And the, the result of the story is that basically we can learn to segment in a very similar way with that segmentation, we can make inferences about the probability that the, a particular output will be 0 or 1 at each point in time. And we can simulate from this model. And I think the simulations from the RSLDS are much more, um, are much more compelling than those from an SLDS. The last example that we have is just sort of a qualitative example to show you know, how might these segmentations be useful in a, um, or provide insight in a more realistic setting. And so we have this awesome data set of players and a basketball team running around on the court. This is from an NBA game in 2013 uh, when LeBron was on the Miami Heat, I guess. I was, I'm also not an NBA fan. So um, <laughs> anyway, what we find is that these player trajectories are segmented into states that are used in particular locations on the court. And, um, and we get things that we can then go and post hoc label as, you know, uh, run to the left corner, or run to the right corner, cuts to the basket, baseline drives, things like that. And intuitively, these things kind of make sense that certain players like uh, Dwayne Wade here often will shoot threes from the right. That's, we should really have Andy Miller in the room here because he's kind of the expert on the NBA side of things. But um, in short, these kind of give you a nice tool to visualize complex dynamical systems in, um, across a variety of domains. Um, I think I'm going to have to skip some sections of this C. elegans 
here. But uh, just to kind of quickly give you a taste of what it looks like, again, remember that our data are these big time series of neural activity over time. Um, it's actually a little bit more interesting than that because we don't just have one worm, we have five different worms in this setting. And in each worm, we observe a different subset of neurons. But still, if we were to do PCA sort of independently on these five worms and project into three-dimensional space, what you'll find is that kind of across worms, you always get these, these sort of loopy patterns of uh, three-dimensional activity that have this sort of, again, this sort of butterfly shape. It's actually kind of similar to the Lorenz models. Um, but they're different rotations of it. You know, on one worm versus the next, there's nothing to sort of tie these together to say that, you know, you should rotate this space in the same way. And so what, uh, I mean, the reason for that is, again, that, you know, in these five worms, we observe, we observe different neurons. So if we were to just pick one, RIGL here, it's observed in worms three and two, but not in uh, one, three, or five. And so the way that we'd like to handle this, again, in this probabilistic framework, there's kind of a straightforward answer to this. The idea is to build up a hierarchical model and say that across worms, certain things are shared, namely the dynamics of the latent state should be shared. And the mapping from a particular neuron, or from latent state to a particular neuron's activity should be pretty much shared across worms as well. Um, however, each worm gets its own set of discrete states and continuous states, which we'd like to infer from the particular subset of neurons that we saw in that worm. So um, with this type of hierarchical approach, we can sort of combine all of the information that we do have at our disposal in order to learn one canonical dynamical system. And when we do that, these are sort of the dynamical system. This is one view of the dynamical system that we learned for this worm. Um, we learned that there's sort of two big loops that characterize the dynamics in this latent space. There's this loop of orange here. And then there's this loop that kind of shoots out on this side and comes back by the red. And furthermore, we learned that these dynamics can be composed out of a bunch of linear dynamical building blocks. So these are color coded. The orange state is kind of you know, shoot off to the right. The teal or light green state here is sort of uh, is very similar but slightly offset. Um, the, this loop over here kind of gets broken down into two pieces, one state that shoots you out and then the red state that brings you back in. When we look at how those segmentations match the manual segmentations by Salcedo at all, um, what we find is that we get a very nice um, alignment of when our model infers a change in discrete state and when Sol, based on uh, some behavioral measure was able to identify a change in behavioral state. So it gives you an automatic way to perform that segmentation, but it also gives you a, a quantitative definition of what those different discrete states mean in terms of their dynamics. And we can look at that for each state, what are the dynamical, uh, you know, where, does, where do these dynamics push you? And we can use that to reconstruct neural activity. So we can do this, you know, if we have noisy data, we can clean it up. If we have missing data, we can fill it in. Again, I'm gonna kinda go through this uh, a bit quickly here. The, uh, the real punchline is just like in the NASCAR, just like in the Lorenzo tractor, just, um, just like in those two examples, the SLDS could give you a similar segmentation, but it wouldn't be able to generate data. And what we see here, this is, you know, now the smoothed, states on the, on the left-hand side here. And when we simulate from the hierarchical SLDS, we get a pretty big jumbled mess. So, you know, the dynamics kind of make sense, but the way that they're used and composed doesn't look anything like the smooth states, the smoothed states from the real neural activity. However, when we generate from our recurrent hierarchical SLDS, we get states that look, I think, qualitatively much more similar between the far left and the far right. Um, it's not perfect. You know, sometimes you stay in the orange state too long and you'll get these little like curling back up types of effects here. But for the most part, it learns that these states are only used in certain sections of this continuous latent space. So this gives us a model that is much better at generating realistic neural activity. And we can use that for all sorts of subsequent tasks of trying to fill in data, of trying to estimate, you know, First of all, goodness of fit of our model. Is it you know, able to recapitulate the data? Um, and potentially even go in and label some of these neurons that you know, we know this is a cell in this location. We don't necessarily know which of 10 potential labels it is. We can use these types of models to address those tasks. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. So just to wrap up, you know, what's next? I mentioned a lot of these joint observations of neural activity and behavior. So far, we've done a lot of modeling of one domain 
holding the other one fixed and kind of relating them post hoc. In many cases, we'd like to try to do this modeling jointly. So that's one thing we're actively working on with Bob Data's group at Harvard Med School. Another, and this is uh, going to tee things up for Matt, is you know, the stick breaking thing has some advantages in terms of the augmentation schemes it allows us to use, but it has really strong constraints on how you can partition this space. And ideally, we'd like to be able to do things that are sort of arbitrarily complicated. Maybe not this messy, but this is like saying, what if I had a neural net that just mapped me from continuous space to some different distribution over, over states in a very nonlinear way? You know, maybe you know, as we try to make this push from really simple models on one end of the spectrum to more complicated, flexible models on the other side, we would like to retain certain pieces, the conditionally linear dynamics, um, the discrete segmentation of states, but we'd like to introduce more flexibility at certain parts of the model. We might say, you know, while I want that conditional linearity, I don't really care that the partition of continuous space is simple in any way. So I can afford to have a more flexible model here. And so that's really where Matt's talk is going to pick up and say, how can I add complexity and flexibility where I need it, but retain structure where I think it's important? And so just to conclude, you know, I think this class of SLDS models is a really nice balance on this spectrum, but the recurrent SLDS kind of pushes us a little bit more toward the, to the right-hand side. Augmentation schemes like the polygamma trick let us do nice inference in certain cases. And these Bayesian formulations are really nice because they allow us to think in a principled way about hierarchical structure and missing data and things like that. Uh, again, I'm very interested in you know, how this model may or may not fit your mold, and if you think there's anything missing, what we can do to try to, uh, to extend this, because this is very much ongoing work. So thank you for your attention. Let me acknowledge my collaborators, obviously Matt, but my former advisor Ryan and Andy Miller, a PhD student in Ryan's group, my advisors at Columbia, Dave and Liam Paninsky, and then Manuel Simmer, who provided all the neural data. Uh, thank you. It's really exciting to be here, uh, to be back, actually. Um, so thanks for the invitation. Um, looking forward to a lot of conversations later today. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, uh, sort of effort we have to compose graphical models uh, with the good parts of neural networks. Um, and as the title says, for structured representations and fast inference. I'll explain what that means. So this is based on uh, joint work with all kinds of people. Um, this is based on a, a NIPS paper with uh, David Dubino and Alex Wolchko and Bob Data and Ryan Adams while I was a postdoc at Harvard. And then uh, uh, some ongoing work with Scott and also Matt Hoffman at Google. Um, Scott's at Columbia. All right, so uh, this the story of this project starts um, with this guy. So this is a mouse uh, on a table at, in a lab at Harvard Medical School. Um, and uh, uh, the neurobiologists in this lab are interested in analyzing and understanding this mouse's behavior um, so they can you know, correlate it with neural activity and, and start to unpack how the brain works. So if you watch um, mice like this for long enough, uh, if you want to, like, you know, come up with a representation for its behavior, I think there's a natural class of hypotheses that might suggest themselves as you watch this. So you'll see that the mouse sort of goes through these uh, uh, brief stereotyped units of action. He'll sort of groom his face, or he'll rear up into the air, or he'll dart forward, uh, or depending on what we're doing in the mouse, maybe he'll like curl up into a ball in fear. Um, so one way to think about uh, understanding this mouse's behavior is to try to discover a representation that parses it into these little units. Um, and so trying to learn how to do this from scratch is something like trying to take an audio waveform, and maybe in a language that you don't know, and discover what the syllabic units are. Right? Syllables are exactly these sorts of objects where they have some, uh, uh, there's some set of syllables, they're reused, and the content of language is in fact how these things are, are composed and stitched together over time. And so what we want to do is exactly analogous to this. We want to discover behavioral syllables um, from data. And the reason we want to do this is that then once we have a representation of mouse behavior um, that's not just you know, many terabytes of raw video, but in fact a, a interpretable, concise, parsed description of it, 
Um, we can then study how this representation changes as we make different interventions into the mouse. So for example, we might uh, zap it in the brain with the laser. Uh, we might change its um, uh, uh, genetic code. We might give it some kind of uh, uh, you know, pharmacological drugs. Um, and then see how that affects this representation, like how it affects the unigram or bigram statistics, this sort of thing. Um, so this is really a, an interesting tool. Scott also talked about many different applications uh, uh, for like learning these sorts of parses and relating them to, to neural activity in particular. So uh, back to this guy. To do this, we have to get this mouse uh, or, or you know, some kind of video stream of this mouse uh, into the computer. So the way we do that is we use a connect depth camera um, shooting from above. So this is the mouse in a somewhat larger uh, bucket, like an open field, um, wandering around and, and doing its thing. Uh, and what we do is we just do some basic um, pre-processing to sort of extract an aligned version of this mouse. Uh, so its head is always facing to the right um, uh, in this ex extracted patch. So when I say we're going to build a model, a generative model for mouse behavior, what I really mean is we're going to model these pixels, like this video stream. That's what we want to do. Um, and this is a view of sort of egocentric behavior. So I think a good way to, to just think about this data, just to orient ourselves, is to think that uh, these frames of video lie on or near some image manifold. Um, so the idea is that this video might be like 60 by 60 pixels or something, right? So 3,600 nominal dimensions. But we don't think we see all possible combinations of, of uh, you know, on-off patterns or, or grayscale patterns in these pixels. In fact, uh, we expect that uh, uh, maybe because this mouse might, uh, you know, change its body sort of uh, smoothly, that there's some kind of a, a low-dimensional manifold immersed in this 3,600-dimensional space. So all of the frames of the video are points that lie on or near this, this manifold. And when we want to model uh, uh, a video, we really want to think about a modeling a trajectory along this manifold. OK, so part of the problem is we want to discover the image manifold, which might be some weird nonlinear shape. Um, but the other problem is to model these dynamics, we want to have some dynamical system model that sort of lives inside the manifold. So in fact, we want to learn uh, to learn this dynamical system, we want to learn a parameterization. We want to learn coordinates for this manifold. And in those coordinates, we want to learn a nice uh, dynamical system model that we can use to parse the behavior. Um, so actually here, we have a joint learning problem between uh, uh, sort of learning this image manifold, but then not just learning it as a set, learning it with coordinates in which our dynamical system models fit well. So we want to do this as a joint learning problem so that whatever you know, priors we write down, uh, we should learn manifold coordinates so that those, those priors work well. So <clears throat> what kind of tools can we use to attack this problem? Um, uh, there are a lot of tools you might reach for. So one set of things you might reach for would be uh, recurrent neural networks. Um, these are, are great for, for modeling video and solving prediction problems. So if our problem were uh, we have all this uh, depth video of mice and we want to produce more frames Right? We want to produce more frames of, of mouse videos. Uh, then RNNs would be great, because they would just learn the density of the data really well and just be able to solve that, that prediction problem. Um, yeah, right. And <laughs> Disney would sue us, because we're generating mouse videos. Um, the, other, <laughs> the other problem with that is that uh, uh, we already have a machine that can generate mouse videos. Right? They're undergrads. And like a connect, you put an undergrad and a connect and a mouse together, they'll generate mouse videos. So we don't need to generate more uh, mouse videos. What we want to do is learn about the data. And I think a, a, you know, a sort of problem with these RNN techniques is you throw an RNN um, at data, it'll learn you know, all kinds of details about the, the predicted density of, of your data. Um, and then you, as a researcher, get like hundreds of megabytes of weights and biases. Uh, and it's just like this neural net goo. What do you do with all these weights and biases? How many modes has it learned? You don't know, right? It's probably learned a multimodal representation, but you don't know that. Somehow it's not explicitly represented as here are the modes in the representation that I've learned. Um, you just learned a density into this, into this blob of weights. So <clears throat> what's another set of tools? What's a set of tools that lets us, uh, uh, you know, if we want to learn a sort of organized representation, if we want to uh, learn how to parse this data, what is it that gives us a way to constrain probability distributions and organize information? 
So probabilistic graphic models are exactly about doing that sort of thing, right? They're about saying, uh, actually, in general, uh, for this complicated data distribution, I'm going to constrain it and organize my representation in a particular way. Um, I should also say that throughout this talk, when I say probabilistic graphical models, um, formally, you know, any distribution has a, has a probabilistic graphical model. I mean, in particular, probabilistic graphical models built out of nice components. And more precisely, I mean sort of like exponential family distributions for which we can evaluate you know, some, uh, 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 some log partition functions, or we have some prox operators, for inference, this sort of thing. So nice exponential family probabilistic graphical models is what I mean when I say PGMs. So PGMs are another great set of tools uh, that are really good at constraining things. In some ways, they're too good at constraining things. Um, if you try to model video, for example, the image manifold that I showed earlier, uh, uh, you know, using things like uh, the tools in this toolbox, like linear, Gaussian observations, this sort of thing. Maybe we don't expect to be able to learn this detailed nonlinear image manifold very well. Uh, so somehow we want to have a combination, maybe, of, of these sorts of ideas. So to think about <coughs> um, comparing these, these two sets of, uh, of toolboxes, um, I have an extremely simple example of what unsupervised learning might be. And this is uh, actually surprisingly similar to the problem of uh, discovering behavior, but this is as abstracted as, and as simplified as, as we uh, can get. Um, so here's a problem of uh, uh, unsupervised learning. Uh, here are a bunch of data points in 2D. I want you to um, learn a representation for them. And you, know, you get to come up with a definition of what that is. So if someone asked me to do that, I would say, uh, well, it looks like they're clustery, <laughs> right? And in fact, I, I generated these data from a, from a Gaussian mixture model. So I would fit a Gaussian mixture model and say, uh, this seems to, you know, may, maybe these clusters are meaningful in the data somehow, and I can fit this kind of model and then go back and check if these, if these clusters are interesting. Um, this worked well because every cluster was a nice Gaussian blob with synthetic data, but actually the story breaks down as soon as we have a bit more complexity that doesn't fit our priors, that doesn't fit the nice like Gaussian observations that we write down. So in fact, here's basically the same problem. If I say uh, learn a representation of, of these data, if you try to fit a Gaussian mixture model to this, um, depending on how you, how you set the hyperparameters, it might try to say model the data density by putting Gaussian components all over the place. Right? And this would, you know, this is maybe a decent representation of the density of the data, but these clusters don't mean anything. Right? We're just using the fact that we can throw down more uh, Gaussian mixture components to just tile the data space. Um, in some ways, this is about misspecification of the model. Right? Before, the model was well specified and, uh, and the fit was great. Um, now, because the cluster components I'm looking for aren't Gaussian, if I apply a Gaussian mixture model, uh, uh, I fit something that, that where my clusters are just junk. Um, so what else can we do? This is where neural net-like techniques might fit in. So you could fit a variational autoencoder to these data. And that'll learn to represent the data density really well, um, eventually. Like when you run this, this fitting algorithm, this thing will just you know, latch on to the, to the data density. And if you drew samples from this distribution, these would look like nice you know, uh, generalized versions of your data. right? It would have learned what the density looks like. So that's great, but the problem here is now that when you learn one of these models, now we have a predictive density, maybe we can sample from, maybe we can even uh, try to evaluate it at locations, but we don't have an explicit representation of these obvious clusters in the data, right? So somehow we want something that's a combination of both of those things, right? We want something where we can learn, uh, you know, we have enough open-ended flexibility in the model um, so that we can learn uh, uh, you know, cluster shapes or something we're not able to write down good priors for, but we still want to learn a nice organized representation. So at a super high level, we'd like to take these uh, hard unsupervised learning problems where, uh, you know, we can't necessarily write down well-specified models, and we want to maybe learn some kind of features from our data as we're fitting the model. We want to learn a set of features so that in a feature space, our uh, our, our priors work well. So in this case, we're learning a feature transformation so that uh, our Gaussian mixture model prior fits well. Um, this is actually exactly analogous to what we do in supervised learning, right? What do we do in supervised learning? We have some crazy, complicated, nonlinear decision boundaries in our data space. We learn some feature transformations, like whether it's 
SVMs, like you know, infinite dimensional embeddings, or whether it's with neural networks, we're learning a sequence of, of feature mappings where we maybe expand the dimension and we uh, uh, compose several of these layers. And then the, the point of that is to say, I, I want to demand, I want to learn features so that at the top level, everything's linearly separable, right? What do you do in, in a neural network? You put a linear logistic regression as the very top layer. So that's just saying that I want to learn features in which uh, my data are easy. And I've, I can reduce it to the easy problem, linearly separable data. Right? We want to do the same thing for unsupervised learning, where we take some complicated thing and we learn features in which maybe our structured priors fit well. Um, so <clears throat> just to uh, tabulate um, some of these high-level things, problems to graphical models uh, are good at some things. Um, they're very good at, at sort of uh, allowing us to constrain and, and structure our representations. Um, <clears throat> they're a good way to express priors and uh, you know, represent uncertainty. Um, <clears throat> and if you have good priors, uh, they can lead to a lot of data efficiency. Um, and they can also lead to a lot of computational efficiency in, in inference. This is, so the data efficiency is contingent on if your priors are good, then they work well. If your priors are bad, then it means you can never learn the right thing because you're like too constrained. Um, so there's some, some big downsides uh, uh, to, to sort of exponential family problems with graphical models. In particular, uh, misspecification, like the rigid assumptions that we end up writing down for these models may not fit our data. Um, and as a result, you end up doing feature engineering, right? So uh, uh, I'm not sure, maybe we've all, we've all been in the situation where you end up taking your data and then you try to manually engineer features so that things look Gaussian, right? You're like trying to re, uh, uh, you know, transform your data in some way so that it fits your model. Um, but it's 2017, we shouldn't be doing that manually. That's like the worst part of machine learning. We should do that automatically somehow. So, uh, and also, I'll, I'm gonna be a bit vague on this, but if you do use more flexible models, like very generic models, um, those can have inference problems. You end up doing things like particle filtering or, or uh, uh, you know, very generic um, uh, MCMC or variational inference methods. Uh, so sort of we lose a lot of the, the power of probabilistic graphical models once we go to like more flexible uh, model families. So deep learning, uh, deep learning is really great for, for a lot of things. I'm gonna start by just saying what it's not so good at. So like I said before, when you fit uh, an RNN model, it learns a lot about how to predict from your data, um, but what you get out at the end is just some neural net goo all these weights and biases. Uh, you don't know what it means. Maybe you haven't learned very much from your data in a, in a scientific sense. Um, the parameterization of neural nets can be kind of difficult if you want to constrain your, your neural nets in a, in a particular way. Um, if you want to encode a prior uh, in some way, it, you know, there aren't that many tools for, for thinking about how to do that. Um, and of course, they can be very data intensive, right? Uh, uh, it might require a lot of data and maybe in a regime or for some set of examples that, that you don't have a lot of uh, data on. But of course, we love deep learning, we love neural networks because uh, those models are very flexible, they have very high capacity, they have this character of feature learning rather than feature engineering. Uh, and again, something that I'll maybe be a little bit more precise on at the end, um, or towards the middle of the talk, uh, there's some really exciting work in approximate inference where you can learn these recognition models uh, uh, that sort of learn how to do your inference for you. Like, let's turn our inference problem into another learning problem. Um, so stepping back and looking at this uh, table, uh, you can see that, hey, these uh, strengths and weaknesses of these two you know, uh, uh, general fields are actually quite complementary, right? And so this is the motivation of why we might want to put these things together, um, both for, for modeling reasons and for inference reasons. Uh, uh, maybe if we can combine the strength of these, th strengths of these two um, fields, we'd be, we'd be quite happy. So <clears throat> that's what the talk is going to be about. Let me check the... Time, I haven't used up all my time, okay. Um, good, so that was the introduction. Uh, here's what I'm gonna tell you for the rest of the talk. Um, there's a modeling idea, uh, which uh, stated briefly is basically graphical models on latent variables and neural net, mo neural net models for observations. Um, then I'm gonna tell you about inference, uh, where the short story is we're gonna use recognition networks to give us graphical model potentials, and then given those uh, graphical model potentials, we'll use fast graphical model inference algorithms, and then I'll show you a demonstration of how to use these techniques to learn this syllable representation of behavior from, from video. So <clears throat> the modeling idea. Um, let's use the, the mouse example uh, to come up with a model. Um, for those of you who are at Scott's talk, this is going to look very similar, except for the bottom layer where we talk about how to generate images. Uh, we're going to have a, a fancier image generation model than a, than a linear Gaussian one. 
<clears throat> so here is the sort of representation we want to learn, this um, decomposition into uh, discrete states. So let's write a generative uh, probabilistic model. Um, let's start by saying, you know, where the states come from. So let's imagine that there's some uh, latent uh, Markov process with some transition matrix. Uh, and then that transition matrix, if you imagine time going to the right here, uh, we're going to generate states sequentially from that. So maybe we're in the blue state for several frames, and then we switch into the green state, and then we switch into the red state. <clears throat> and so the way to think about these states is that each one corresponds to a pr particular primitive behavior. OK, so while we're in the blue state, we want to have a way of generating sort of blue state behavior. Maybe it's this darts down here. Um, and then when we switch, we want to generate some kind of pause behavior. The way we're going to represent that is by, for each state, we're going to have a linear dynamical system on some latent states. So you can imagine it's sort of like this. We're going to have, for every colored state, we have a set of linear dynamical system parameters. And the way, the way we generate the sort of uh, uh, latent manifold coordinates, if you like, of, uh, uh, of this video is by these rolling out this switching linear dynamical system where we're in one set of linear dynamics at first, and then when we switch discrete states, we switch to a new set of linear dynamics. Yeah? Doesn't all of this rely on the fact that you know what the discrete states are? Uh, no, actually, so we're going to learn the discrete states from scratch. Uh, yeah, so the question was, um, do we have to know the discrete states, states in advance? And actually, a wonderful thing about these sorts of methods is if you have some human labels, you can add them in, right? You can always like shade some of the nodes, and the inference learning algorithms will be able to deal with sort of any amount of shaded or unshaded nodes. So if you do have some labels, you can use them. Um, but in fact, uh, the way we learn these models and, and a way they can work in general is purely unsupervised. So the only observed stuff is going to be the video frames, and then the uh, discrete states, the continuous states, the you know continuous parameters, the sort of discrete state parameters, all that's, that can be learned from scratch. <clears throat> so I'm going to clean up this picture a little bit into a graphical model. I'm going to write the continuous states as the sequence of x's here. Uh, and I'm going to write all the parameters just in this one symbol, theta. <clears throat> so what's left is to generate these images on the bottom. So <clears throat> uh, the way we're going to generate an image conditioned on these, remember, these are like the 10-dimensional, low-dimensional coordinates. These are like the puppet strings of the, of the mouse. And then we want to go from those puppet strings to generating an actual image of a mouse. We're going to learn a neural network model as an observation model. Um, I don't have time to go too much into detail, but this is exactly the sort of thing that you see in uh, uh, you know, variational autoencoders, very much related to what you see in like generative adversarial networks. Um, we essentially have a sort of neural network decoder model where we take our uh, latent state. And you can imagine if these are the coordinates of that latent state, we're just going to map it through some parametric function approximator that has this you know, uh, compositional structure to give a sort of mean in our high dimensional image space and uh, you know, some kind of covariance in our high dimensional image space. And then our images are going to be sampled based on that. Um, so sort of like we're taking a low dimensional code and we're decoding it using some neural network. And we're going to learn all of the parameters that go in these layers, all these weights and biases. We're going to learn all those at the same time as we're learning everything else. <clears throat> One last thing is I'll put a box uh, to say if we have many different video sequences, I'll use a box in the graphical model convention to, to um, denote replication of these sort of local latent variables and the, and the observations. And then these global parameters are shared across all the videos. So um, that is one particular model to generalize a bit and just simplify notation. Uh, I'm going to um, compress this uh, uh, graphical model a little bit. First, I'm going to get rid of time. I'm just going to say. Uh, time might still be there, but I'm just going to compress it so we can refer to it more. And you know that complexity is just going to be lurking behind the scenes. And I'm also going to get rid of the fact that we ha might have multiple um, latent variables that we might you know uh, uh, treat separately. I'm just going to make a very compact representation here. So the point of doing this is that now we've distilled uh, uh, down a model family that really is just saying something quite simple. So I want to think of this. Uh, model is sort of having two halves. There's a top half and a bottom half. In the top half, we're going to have all of our nice exponential family graphical model stuff. So this is all the latent variables. And we're going to have like conjugate priors and everything. Everything's nice and hunky-dory here in terms of inference and, and uh, uh, computation. So there, we're going to be able to leverage a lot of model structure in our, in our inference and in our modeling, like encoding things. And then there's the other half. The other half is going to be something quite generic. Right? The other half, this lower half, is going to say, 
we're going to have uh, some maybe neural network observation distribution that gives us our observations, like our, our images y. Um, and so the idea in this half is everything's quite generic. You know, we don't have really strong organizing priors. In fact, a way to think about this is very much like semi-parametric statistics, where we, we have two parts of our model. One is like very structured and organized, and the other is just like a, a blob to soak up complexity. Right? And in the time series case, we're going to say, I want to be able to, I don't care the details about how you render an image. That could be just some neural net. I don't care about those details. But I want all the interesting correlations across those video frames. I want to explain those correlations through time in terms of a structured graphical model representation. Right? So we have this nice like decomposition into saying, like, there's some latent variables uh, that are nice and organized. And those are used to explain the correlations between our complicated variables. But then maybe there's some part of these complicated variables, like these frame-by-frame -frame observation distributions that I don't care about the details, just fit it with something uh, very high capacity. So um, as I said, this is sort of a prototype model that contains uh, quite a few examples. I won't mention all of them, but if you go into like Kevin Murphy's giant 1,200-page textbook, there's a lot of work on graphical models. And I guess the point here is that not only can you know, is this um, modeling framework talking about those models somehow. But in fact, all of these uh, models had very you know, specific model structure exploiting inference algorithms worked out for them over the years. You know, like back in my day, NIPS was all about, like, here's my new graphical model and my you know, bespoke inference method um, that exploits all the graphical model structure. And <clears throat> nowadays, you see a lot more sort of generic uh, inference stuff. But the point here is that we're going to be able to leverage all of the, you know, whatever model structure exploiting inference algorithms people had for any of these models, we can use them in, in the inference learning algorithm that I will tell you about next. So <clears throat> inference. As Scott said earlier, uh, anybody can draw arrows. <laughs> like Anybody can write down a complicated model. Uh, the real challenge is if you can do effective inference in that model. Um, and that's really where the, the meat of this work is. It's not that it's hard to write down you know, graphical models and neural nets, the point is that we have a very nice inference story that works for all of these things. Any questions before I dive into some inference details? OK, I've deleted on some of these slides some of the math, but not all of these slides. So here's a mathy slide. I want to tell you about what inference looks like when we have all kinds of model structure, when we don't have any neural networks that we have to deal with. What did we do? What were all the things that we could do to exploit that structure? And then I'm going to tell you, OK, but now when we have more general things like observation distributions, um, you know, what can we still retain? You know, what can we still use? Uh, uh, how much of that structural exploiting inference can we, can we uh, still take advantage of? So here is a very uh, a relatively simple time series model. Um, the idea is that uh, our, we're going to have a latent linear Gaussian system on x. Uh, and then the y's are going to be linear Gaussian observations of that state. And then theta is a conjugate prior. Um, so, you know, everything's linear, Gaussian, and conjugate. There's got to be a lot that we can do uh, uh, for inference and learning in this model, right? So <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about um, variational inference, a high level, structured mean field variational inference in particular. Um, don't have time to go into the details, but, uh, 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 you know, this is a fairly standard um, inference framework to think in. So the basic idea is we're going to approximate the posterior distribution, given some observed data y, we're going to try to approximate the uh, posterior distribution over theta and x with some uh, tractable um, uh, uh, approximation. So we have an approximating family of distributions. <clears throat> and the question is, what can we do uh, when we have all this model structure? So the problem, so the problem is we want to fit this approximating distribution, and we want to fit it by you know, making it as close as possible to this posterior, and that through some standard variational mean field stuff is going to correspond to maximizing this objective function here. Okay, So what can we do with all this, this model structure? The first thing, which is a little subtle, is that, in fact, just assuming this factorization, this model structure tells us what the optimal form of each of these densities is. So like uh, uh, the densities that sort of solve the Euler-Lagrange equations over all possible densities. We already, so that's already cool. The fact that I can write this objective with like, uh, parentheses instead of square brackets. Um, so we have some objective in terms of some parameters of what we know to be the optimal density families for these two uh, factors. All right, now we have an objective. What can we do? We, this objective has an expectation, right? That's an integral. Um, in What do we do in the generic case? In the generic case, whenever you see an expectation, you just Monte Carlo sample it. 
right? And whenever you see parameters to optimize, you call an auto diff algorithm, right? You just do generic gradient descent, Monte Carlo over any expectations. What can we do here now that we have all the structure to play with? So the first thing is we can evaluate this expectation without Monte Carlo. We can evaluate this expectation exactly, right? So that's good. No, no need to introduce variance into our, uh, you know, uh, uh, optimization killing variance, right? It's like job killing regulations or something like optimization <laughs> killing variance. Um, what else can we do? So you might think, okay, great. You can evaluate this objective without Monte Carlo. I'm just going to do gradient descent on it. Aha, I can do more. So these, these parameters, the eta theta are like the variational parameters for the global factor, and the eta x are like the variational parameters for your local latent variables. So if you have a lot of local latent variables, you have quite a few, uh, you know, this eta x parameter might be quite large. In fact, we don't have to do gradient descent over that. We can actually partially optimize out that uh, the parameters of our local variational factor. We can just optimize them out perfectly and get a new one parameter objective by substituting that back in. That's pretty cool already, and that's from the fact that this is all linear Gaussian and nice. We can perform that optimization very efficiently. Um, something like that, yeah. Yeah, so because I could write this optimum uh, not just, well, it depends. There's something nice about this optimization. In some cases, in this case, it's, a, it's an analytic expression that I can evaluate with a fixed depth circuit. I don't have to implicitly define it as like the solution to some iterative procedure. That's not always true in general, but that's true here. But there's something nice. Uh, this model structure lets us perform this optimization very nicely. Cool. Now we just have to do gradient descent on this much smaller set of parameters, right? Instead of having thousands of local parameters, I just have this, uh, you know, the global parameters. Now I'm going to do flat gradient descent, right, on this. Aha, no, we can do something even better still. Instead of just flat gradient descent, we can do natural gradient descent on this for free. In fact, it's better than free. It turns out you can do natural gradient descent on this objective faster than you can do flat gradient descent. Yeah, so natural, it, it's a bit, <laughs> so I don't have time to go into the details about what natural gradient descent is, so think of it as some kind of, uh, as a gradient descent method that uses some kind of second order information in the sense of second derivatives. So you can think of, I'm going to like say a bunch of jargon in, in hopes to like overwhelm you and make you stop asking me. So you can interpret it like a generalized Gauss-Newton method, if you like. Uh, 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 you can, so you can interpret it as like a quasi-Newton method. It's just we have some kind of preconditioner that's going to say there's some peculiarity to how we're choosing to um, parameterize our variational family. And uh, we don't want to have to pay for the you know, the curvature that might just be in our parameterization. Somehow we want to do a, an optimization on the manifold of, of you know, variational distributions uh, without having to just, you know, uh, uh, you know, if we have a bad parameterization, we, we don't want to have, have that screwing up our optimization algorithm, like uh, making the conditioning of our optimization algorithm worse. So natural gradients are a way of doing an optimization, in some sense, on the... Uh, uh, sort of on the manifold of approximating probability distributions directly in a coordinate free way okay. rather than a, in a coordinate specific way. Natural natural parameters. Yeah, we only have so many words. Uh, it's actually, it's not gradient descent in natural parameters though. Okay. So <laughs> we just call things natural when we like them. Um, <laughs> so there's something nice, better than flat gradient descent, and you can compute it faster. In fact, just you can use the information that you have to compute anyway just to evaluate this objective. You don't have to do a back prop. It's actually like twice as fast as flat gradients. Super cool. All this, you know, the details aren't important, um, but there's some very nice expression uh, uh, that you have here. And if you have lots of examples, like lots of different uh, movies or, you know, sec sections of movies or something, then uh, you get this nice, just like a sum appears here. And when we have a lot of data, we're going to Monte Carlo subsample that, that sum uh, and do stochastic uh, variational inference, that's what the S is. <clears throat> so this was just to sort of give you an overview of like when we have all this model structure, there's a ton we can do to exploit it. Let me show you briefly what that algorithm ends up looking like. Um, uh, step one is we sample you know, some mini batch. We use our nice linear Gaussian observation model to compute evidence potentials. Okay, that's step one. Um, step two is we run like fast message passing algorithms. We do our nice exponential family uh, computation. And then step three is there is no step three. In fact, all the stuff we just computed, just doing message passing, we just write a trivial expression for the natural gradient in terms of that stuff we already computed um, to optimize these global parameters. So that's what a single stochastic natural, stochastic natural gradient step 
on the global variational parameters looks like. Um, super nice. So natural gradient SVI, um, we don't, like the problem with this now is that if we had a very general observation model, the story breaks down. Uh, we can't do all this nice local latent variable inference. And we'd have to resort to sort of very generic optimization methods to do our local inference. So that local inference where I was like, hey, we can just partially optimize stuff. If you have a general observation model, you can't just like click things together and write down the, the optimum very nicely. Um, you have to do some very generic like gradient descent type procedure. And so that means with general observation models, uh, to do this procedure, you would have to do gradient descent within your stochastic gradient descent. Like for each stochastic gradient, you'd have to run some generic nonlinear programming problem to do local inference. That's, that's, we can't do that. So that sucks for general observations. But it was nice while we had this natural gradient SVI set up because we got to compute the optimal local factor, it exploited all of the model structure. Um, it supports, I'll say a little more about this later, but uh, we can sort of handle, if you have missing data, we can handle missing data, no problem. Um, and we got these uh, super cheap natural gradients. So what do we do when we have these general observation models? Um, again, I'm going to have to skip over the details here, but we, um, also let me check the time, okay. Um, <clears throat> when we have these general observation models, one thing we can do is we can run a uh, you know, generic optimization problem in the inner loop of our SGD to do our local variable inference. But that's too expensive if you just have to take a billion you know, gradient steps to fit your neural networks. So what people do in, uh, in sort of neural net generative modeling is they use this uh, brilliant technique um, uh, referred to as, as uh, using a variational autoencoder. And the basic idea is, let's just say that our local variable factor, instead of defining it as the solution to some optimization problem that I have to rerun for every mini batch that I sample, Let's just say that my the variational factor I use might not be optimal. It's just going to be some uh, parametric function approximator applied to the data. So when I sample data, I'm just going to have some parametric function approximator that gives me uh, my local inferences. And I'm just going to use them, even if they're suboptimal. And those the parameters of that parametric function approximator, I can just learn those in an outer loop. I can just be doing gradient descent on those. Um, so this is an idea of using sort of a, uh, a function approximator or a neural network to do our very, uh, to do our local variable variational inference for us. Kind of a subtle idea. I don't have time to say too much more. Let me just say how these sorts of things um, compare at a high level. So the big win is that it's fast for general observations because when you sample a mini batch, you're just going to apply some neural network and that's going to give you your local variable inferences. You know that's like a fixed depth circuit of some kind. Um, Are you applying it forward? Or are you doing inference back? Um, yeah, so you just sample a uh, data mini batch, and now you have a neural net that takes in a data mini batch and spits out mean, uh, you know, in this example, it spits out some variational factors for your variational family on your local latent variables, right? It's kind of, it's a little weird. It takes like a conceptual leap to think about, but I can just write in my objective that, oh yeah, I have some function that does that, and now my objective function uh, depends on what that function is, and in particular, it depends on what those the parameters of that recognition network are. So something that's a bit confusing to me is, um, on the one hand, you have the neural network as a decoder yeah. uh, to get back to the pixels. Not that's right. Not decoder, yeah. I want to say that you're starting from the pixels, exactly. sort of mapping it down, then putting it through the Bayesian framework, and then mapping it back up. Exactly. So this is, this is why they're called... So trying to trying yeah. that together. That's right. So this is why they're called variational autoencoders, exactly. It's because in this variational inference framing, we can get, as, as John just said, um, we sort of have this decoder model, which is like our generative model from our low dimensional latent stuff to our images. And then this thing that I'm calling a recognition network is really another parametric function approximator that takes in images and spits out beliefs, right? Sort of a, a guess at what those latent variables are. So it looks very much like an autoencoder in the sense that we have one parametric function approximator going one way and then the other one going the other the way. The decoder and the decoder are conceptually different. Or no? Yes, they are conceptually different. Uh, yes, they, they sort of output potentially different types. Um, yeah. There's a lot that could be said that I'm you know, skipping over in the, in the interest of time. The high level view... The case that, that if, if this is an autoencoder that you are training in the sense that you're going to try to, in the end, fit things, including what are the states and the frequent statistics of Pino states, and so, the decoder and the encoder, all this sort of fit in order to go from the pixels back to the pixels in a, with high probability, something like that. 
Yeah, so the short answer is yes. I think if you're asking, you know, does this work ultimately have a similar structure to a, can you interpret it and look at it like an autoencoder? Yes. So we call these structured variational autoencoders. Aha, structured VAs. Um, in terms of if you want to compare to sort of existing ideas, um, usually these variational autoencoders have some relatively simple or generic latent variable model as opposed to this like complicated graphical model structure that we have upstairs. That's sort of the difference. Um, and so those have a more direct interpretation as like encode decode, whereas we have like encode and then complicated graphical model stuff and then maybe decode. Um, there's a lot that can be said about this stuff. So a very high level uh, view in the middle column here, oops, uh, is that this technique is very fast for general observations, um, but it means that we're spitting out suboptimal local variational factors. We're relying on these parametric function approximators to do all of our local variable inference. And so if your local variable model gets more and more complicated, you might expect that uh, uh, this becomes very, you know, this becomes harder or more data intensive. Um, it also doesn't support all the arbitrary, sort of, for every different uh, data pattern, like if you have some missing data, you have to train a separate, rec well, in, at least in the vanilla versions, you have to train a separate recognition model for every missing data pattern. Right? Of course, there's a big design space here, but that's the general idea. You're fitting one recognition model for one inference query, something like this. And we don't get these cheap natural gradients. So, as you can imagine, when I set up these bullets with the pluses and the minuses, I'm going <laughs> to you know, set up a third thing, which is uh, maybe we can try to get the best of both worlds. <clears throat> so, in particular, we want a method, the structured VAEs method uh, from our NIPS paper, that is fast for general observations, um, but also has all these nice properties that we had back in the structure exploiting methods. Um, so, inference, like I said, the big idea is just we're going to use these recognition networks, but instead of outputting our entire variational factor in one shot, we're going to do something that looks more like a conditional random field. We have recognition models that output nice conjugate graphical model potentials. And then, using those conjugate graphical model potentials, we're back in graphical model world we can do our nice structure exploiting inference algorithms. Here is a slide where I removed all the math. Okay, so now we have a similar sort of model, but with the red arrows, we want to think of that as like neural network observation models. Um, here's a way to think about what that's doing. Um, for every time in this time series, right, we have some observation potential, some evidence potential that says, okay, given that the image was this, that implies something about what I think the latent state was, right? Uh, and so that's sort of saying like, hey, this is what I think the latent state was. And this is some, you know, cartoon, messy blob. This is not some nice Gaussian evidence potential that we can just fold in and like do message passing. <clears throat> so what do we do? Um, here is where we just learn a recognition model to say, uh, uh, given the data, let's just learn a mapping that takes in data and spits out a nice evidence potential, right? So sort of the, the problem of conditioning on evidence is exactly like, well, here's data give me a guess or a potential on what you think the latent state was, right? <clears throat> and we're saying we have this crazy, complicated, nonlinear function that goes from data to some uh, sort of gross guess. Let's just parameterize a function class that takes in the data, does some crazy nonlinear computation, and then outputs a nice guess, like a nice Gaussian potential on this. And then that lets us sort of go back into our structured mean field land and synthesize all these guesses across time with our current estimates of the dynamical system parameters and stitch everything together in a nice coherent way. So here's uh, what the algorithm looks like. We sample data mini batch. We apply the recognition networks. Now, instead of using the observation model, we apply the recognition networks to get our nice evidence potentials. Then <clears throat> we run our fast PGM inference algorithms. Um, in this case, for an SLDS, we have sort of two layers of message passing. <clears throat> then using what we've computed there, we sort of sample and compute flat gradients with respect to the neural net parameters um, of the recognition model, the encoder and the, and the decoder. Uh, and then we can use what we've already computed to sort of cheaply compute the, uh, uh, the natural gradient. So that's all the math stuff. And let me just briefly skim through some uh, uh, pictures. So here's a toy example. This is like the, uh, uh, the swirly, twisty uh, mixture model uh, example that I showed you before. There are two views on the data here. This is the data space, and here's the latent space, which I've initialized to be an isometry and also two-dimensional. So the idea here is that um, we want on this side to see, this is a, um, you know, a Dirichlet process mixture model. These are the uh, components, and we want to see this thing going to fit uh, our data and our data space, like fitting the data density well. 
And then in the latent space, we want to see this thing learn how to straighten out the data so that in the latent space, a Gaussian mixture model prior fits things well. Um, and the fact that we have you know, 15 or 30 or however many components I ran this example with, um, we're going to use you know, uh, Dirichlet sparsifying prior stuff to like choose the right number of components. So I hit play. Yeah. It's like regularizing. Yeah, and you can do all the Dirichlet process business and stuff in this framework as well. Um, so I hit play. It fits the mixture model super fast, um, so it's even hard to see how quickly it prints out components. And then you can see that it has this nice, you know, it's learned uh, nice density model for our data where it's learned separate components for each different blob. These two greens are very similar color, but that's a, a coincidence. You can see over here that they're in fact separate Gaussian mixture components. Um, and it's straightened out this space so that now instead of these bendy non-Gaussian things, it's straightened them out to look Gaussian. That's because we were jointly fitting. We wrote down a Gaussian mixture model prior, and then we gave it this, these nonlinear maps to sort of encode from data space to latent space and decode from latent space to data space, uh, uh, and learned how to use these nonlinear mappings to make our priors fit well. Um, I'm going to skip over this example. I'm going to play the movie and not say what it is. It's something to do with time series and linear dynamical systems. Yeah, it's pleasing even when I don't describe it. Um, if you'd like. <laughs> If you'd like to describe, if you'd like to talk about it later, I'd be be happy to. Um, but we're sort of learning a nice linear dynamical system for some uh, simple nonlinear data. Natural gradients are good. Um, okay, so <laughs> apologies for the the speed version. So uh, just to emphasize two points, um, one is that just like in graphical models, so in graphical models, when you write down a model. Uh, it sort of specifies, in some ways, an exponential number of inference circuits, right? You give me any pattern of shaded nodes, right? Here, these are like nodes that are unshaded. But you give me any pattern of shaded and unshaded nodes, and the promise and the hope of graphical models, certainly built out of these tractable components, is I'll have a nice inference algorithms that, algorithm that will you know, compute expectations of the unshaded nodes, this sort of thing. Um, so we can handle, just like in graphical models, we can sort of handle arbitrary inference queries. Whereas this becomes difficult if you're just training a single network to answer one inference query. If you train a network that sort of takes in all the data and spits out an answer, um, then if I give you an example where you have some missing data, you might have to like say, oh, I have to refit a brand new uh, inference network. Um, the asterisk is, see next slide, this depends on the granularity of our recognition network. So if you gave me an image that had half of its pixels missing, right, then I can't do nice inference because this you know, my model and my recognition models took in an entire image. And so I had this nice decomposability over time, but I've lost some of the decomposability. I just can I just compartmentalize a bit. Um, also uh, important to emphasize that there's a lot of exciting work on designing recognition networks that take advantage of, you know, some amount of model structure, like just the fact that it's a time series or something. Um, this is uh, an inference network. Uh, it's a, a version of what was designed by Evan Archer and, and some others at Columbia. <clears throat> and the key point here is that this SVAE framework we have, um, sort of like if you like your inference network, you can keep it. So if you like, you know, using, uh, uh, you know, instead of doing message passing inference with node by node potentials, if you want to spit out the entire variational potential on this entire lower bit, and then just use the graphical model inference algorithms on the on the top chain, you can do that as well. So SVAEs kind of give you this knob to say how much of your inference do you want to do is this generic blob of parametric function approximator, and how much do you want to do using your graphical model uh, prior. Um, also, super briefly, Scott mentioned about having these, um, you know, this RSLDS that kind of broke some of our uh, nice inference algorithms. <clears throat> so in this talk, I've, been, I've entirely been talking about complicated observation models. Um, but in fact, this, this framework is more general. It can handle uh, difficult sort of internal nodes as well. Um, basically with the, the same sort of machinery. So for example, if you had, if you wanted to say that instead of the discrete states being generated in an open loop, in the sense of not depending on the continuous states, if you wanted to have a dependence from the continuous states to our discrete state, like saying in some parts of continuous state space, uh, we're more likely to transition into, into a particular state, um, you could learn a complex dependence there. In fact, a complex nonlinear neural net kind of MLP dependence um, and this inference technology and, and learning technology still applies uh, essentially off the shelf. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to go super fast. I'm just going to show you some, some pictures of, of learning uh, this mouse behavior. So here are some video uh, frames in like a blue and yellow sort of color scheme of, uh, of mice. If you fit a very shell autoencoder to these mice and then just decode samples, um, you get nice, slightly denoised mice. Um, I understand that these might be kind of small to look at, but uh, you have these really nice, you get, you get a really nice image model. That's sort of a check to say, 
uh, we can learn nice image models of, of, of mice. Um, what if you fit a latent linear dynamical system for mouse video, right? So that's increasing the complexity of the model, incorporating time now. <clears throat> and what, what we have here are three examples of uh, uh, real and synthetic data. The real data is in the bottom row of every pair of rows, so there's real data on the bottom here. Um, and then there's the model's uh, prediction uh, up until the red line. So this is the, this is the model's prediction. It's shown the data frames up until the red line. And so up until the red line, the model's doing a filtering thing, just saying, estimating what the um, denoised version of the image is given the observations. And then after the red line, it's just predicting uh, uh, without seeing the actual image frames. And these are subsampled frames, so it's actually able, this is about 120 frames ahead, it's able to have a really nice coherent mouse image for a, a very long time. It has sort of like high fidelity, long-term um, predictions that look like a mouse, and it looks like a mouse behaving. This mouse is sort of, he's extended and he's curling up into a ball and his ears are sticking out at the top. Um, these other ones have him in a ball and extending, or like uh, this is him raising his head up. Um, these are all sort of like very nice, plausible completions of the video. So given that the linear dynamical system can model these mouse videos well, then we can fit a switching linear dynamical system using the same set of techniques. And here are just a few states. Um, so this is a panel of different instances of when a particular state index was used. And then they'll all be doing different things. And then when a white square appears in the bottom right of every panel, that's like when that state was being deployed in that, in that video segment. So this is the start of a rear, sort of all these mice are going up to the rear. You can see the, uh, the bright intensity as their head's getting um, higher up in the air. Uh, this is a fall from a rear. You know, uh, these are easy to see, but you can, uh, as soon as the white dot turns on, he's sort of falling um, from head raised position to a lower position. So if you the example video, and then the square is when this particular state is active? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, and here's grooming. Might be a little hard to see. I've looked at these videos for a long time, so I'm really used to parsing them. But if you look at some of these, you can see that when the white square is on, uh, he's curled up into a ball, and also you can see his ears wiggling. Uh, and his ears wiggling is because he's like grooming his tummy. Um, so we picked out this nice grooming state. Okay, so um, high level story, uh, structured representation, or like uh, graphical models, let's see, composing graphical models and neural networks for structured representations, that's the modeling side, and fast inference, that was all the inference technology we can use. Um, thanks uh, for listening, and thanks again to my collaborators. I'm happy to take any questions afterwards.